Welcome to Post Doom, regenerative conversations exploring overshoot grief, grounding, and gratitude. I'm your host, Michael Dowd. And in this conversation, recorded in August of 2019, I speak with a dear friend and brother, Frank Forensich. Frank's an internationally known expert on health and, and human adaptation. He's got two amazing websites, exuberantanimal.com, that's exuberantanimal.com, and his Sapiens project is at sapiens.earth. In fact, he's got a series of interviews. He interviewed me as part of that series, kind of fireside chat, and I highly recommend those. He's the author of several books, The Art is Long, Beautiful Practice, and The New Old Way, and I encourage you to see his author's page. Again, Frank Forensich on Amazon. You'll, you can see his books. We had fun. Enjoy. Frank, I'm just delighted. We haven't seen each other in uh, what, two or three years, and I'm delighted that you could be part of the series. What are you particularly passionate about or, or, um, or concerned about at this time? Uh, here we are in uh, August of 2019. So give us a little sense of, of your work and also what you're passionate or committed to or concerned about at this time. Right. Well, um, I've got a long history in the physical arts and um, a lot of time in the martial arts in particular. And throughout that time, I've been really curious about the history of the body and the state of the body. And that led me on this journey to go to Africa and study human history, human origins, that whole thing. And it really sharpened this contrast for me, this um, difference between the ancestral environment and the modern, what you might call the alien environment. <laughs> I like that. And as I give presentations to people, I often talk about the state of the animal in the modern world. And that's become a bigger and bigger part of my work, looking at what I call the primate's predicament. Yeah, how are we doing? How is the human animal doing in the modern world? And of course, when you look at it from that perspective, then you have to take on all the challenges of what's happening to the biosphere. And that, of course, is the alpha issue of the day. And that's what um, is now taking the lion's share of my attention. So starting with the human animal, starting with health and the body and putting it in that context. That's what really consumes my, uh, my curiosity right now. That's great. And say a little bit about Exuberant Animal and, and uh, the kind of work that you offer. The workshops that I do um, have changed a lot over the years. Uh, at the beginning, they were primarily uh, physical training experiences for people. And now I've added in a lot more content having to do with the state of the biosphere and trying to make that physical training experience relevant to the challenges of our day. So we do, we do meditation, we do a lot of social time and we do presentations as well. So it's, it's very comprehensive, the, the kind of training that I do. One of the things that I first ask is sort of, there's a series of questions or sets of questions that I've been asking the various guests, participants in this series. Um, and the first one typically is around language. Like, you know, what do you think of when you hear the term post doom? Like, what does that bring to mind? Um, and then what name or description do you prefer when speaking about the fact that we're living in contracting times, uh, a deteriorating future? I mean, some people have talked about civilizational reboot or catabolic collapse is the way John Michael Greer speaks about it. Obviously population die off or, uh, the extinction of Homo Colossus uh, in William Catton's terms, uh, sixth grade extinction. Like what language do you use? And then what, if anything, comes to mind when you hear the term or how would you interpret post-doom? Right. Well, what I, the language I use when I talk about the near-term horizon, I talk about the big suffering and the oh, big wow. impermanence. And the reason I use that, it's, it's a play on the Buddhist perspective where for an individual person, we have our own sense of impermanence and our own sense of suffering. And, that, and you could call that the little impermanence and the little suffering. But now we're looking at the, the fate of the entire biosphere and that would be seen as the big suffering or the big impermanence. And that of course is right on our calendar and it's, uh, it's here now. 
Wow, I like that. I mean, I, I will probably borrow that, steal it, whatever you want to call it, but I, I will probably, uh, I typically, when I, when I do something like that, I prefer the term great to big. So I may talk about the great impermanence or the great suffering. Sure. Um, but uh, I, I like that distinction between sort of our small self and our great self or our big self and, and yeah, yeah. in terms of impermanence. We'll, we'll come back to that theme of, of death and impermanence uh, here later in this conversation. Right. Um, Cool. Well, here the, the, the heart and soul of this uh, conversation series, this little project, the post-Doom project, is really inviting people who have been uh, uh, major presenters in this whole field of um, right relationship to our animal self, our larger self, our green self, mm -hmm. um, and alignment of the well-being of our inner self, our bodily self, our bioregion, our planet our communities and what have you. But really inviting folks to share their story. Like how did you come to an understanding of a contracting time? And those of us who were born in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, um, uh, had very different expectations uh, for much of our life than we now have. So share with us how you made that transition and feel free to take as much time as you want. I really wanna share your sort of your story around all this. Right, well, I have a, actually a very vivid memory of being a sophomore in high school. And this was in California and this was pretty, uh, this was the 1960s. And in a sense, it was pretty idyllic, you know, post-war economic boom. And there was, you know, some, uh, some good news on the horizon for American culture and that kind of thing. And I remember going into the library in my high school, had some time off, looking at the books, and I picked up a book called The Population Bomb. And I read that more or less in one sitting. And that was radically disruptive to my life because all of a sudden I was looking at my future in an entirely new way. And of course, Paul Ehrlich laid out this really catastrophic future for, for human beings. And that had a profound impression on me. Now, now of course, let me, let me just jump in just because it's too coincidental or providential or however you understand these things to not mention. Literally 45 minutes ago, I got an email from Paul because he's part of the series uh, and we scheduled a date in, uh, in October. But I thought it was interesting that, uh, you know, here I am talking to you just, just a few minutes after uh, we yeah. scheduled the time for him to be on this. Yeah. Continue. Yeah. So that, that was huge for me. And uh, I actually got to... Um, I was a student of his later on at Stanford and got to see him lecture, and that, that was very exciting for me. But that was the first big blast to my sense of what the future might be. And I think my reaction to that, my response was pretty typically human. I tried to deny it. I tried to push it away. And I got involved in other things. And I got involved in sports. And I played water polo. And, um, various forms of, of substance recreation type of thing. <laughs> and all these efforts to deny and distract myself from this reality that was coming down. But growing up in California, spent a lot of time going to the Sierras, got involved in rock climbing and just in love with the natural world. And I continued reading about the subject. And then there was this whole series of books that echoed Paul Ehrlich. And it was like one blow after another, reading Silent Spring, reading Overshoot in particular, reading um, all of these reports, the early reports on climate change, and then Bill McKibben's book, The End of Nature. And all of these things eventually brought me to the point where I said, I can no longer deny or distract or amuse myself from this. And it's, you know, this has spanned several decades. But um, that's been my journey. Yeah. And so now here I am face to face with the big impermanence. And yeah. um, it's a tremendous challenge. But uh, here we are. Yeah, no, exactly. Well, I'm curious, what triggered your, um, your worst episodes of sadness and grief, if you feel comfortable sharing that? Um, and what, if any, spiritual, philosophical, or psychological perspectives or practices helped carry you through? Right. Well, just seeing what happened to the Santa Clara Valley in California, which um, 
my my parents grew up there and for their generation the santa clara valley was pretty utopian i mean it, it was good agriculture really good agriculture orchards everywhere and you could still hunt and fish in the hills you could do all sorts of uh nature-based uh, wandering in the santa clara valley and during the course of my life i also spent a, a little bit of time as a uh, pilot and so i got to see the santa clara valley from the air where's where's santa clara valley I, i'm not that familiar with california well, it's, uh, it's silicon valley oh okay yeah sure uh, yeah, the same thing and so in the course of my lifetime, I got to see Santa Clara Valley go from kind of a rural paradise to this just incredibly intensive, technological, congested, polluted place that is, is very uh, inhospitable to human life. Yeah. So that's what really drove it home for me. And that inspired a lot of sadness and a lot of grief. Um, the thing that kept it together for me, I think, was my training in the martial arts and having that consistent, disciplined focus every night, doing it over and over again. That helped a lot. Yeah. But uh, still, you, you, you can only do so much. And the grief is always there. I mean, it, it doesn't go away. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. Well, I'm curious, how do you coach people or counsel people? Like, like let's say, let, let me offer two different hypotheticals, like a, a young man or woman, and then and, uh, and a, a man or woman in their retirement, you know, quote unquote, retirement years, who are grappling with overshoot and resource depletion and climate chaos and blah, blah, blah. How, what, what is your, how do you approach them? What do you say to a younger person and an older person, um, uh, and whether it's the same or different in terms of how, yeah, whatever you would say that would be, that you would be, that they would find helpful or <clears throat> inspiring? Right. Well, in a nutshell, I, I counsel people that we have to take it on face to face. I mean, they, they, this situation calls for radical honesty. There, there can be no dodging or denial or amusement. That, that is completely inappropriate now. We have to see it as it is. And then we have to avoid getting sucked down into the quagmire of depression and everything that goes along with it. So the thing that I advise people to do and that I try and practice in my life is find the most meaningful thing that you could be doing and focus on that. And every one of these reminders that we get every day, uh, the bad news train that comes across the internet of things that are happening to the natural world, instead of having those things drag you down into the quagmire, use those as tools to help you focus. Yeah. Find the most meaningful thing, and use the bad news to help you focus on it. And it kind of works. I mean, it's not a foolproof solution, but it, it works a little bit for me. And I, I think it can work for other people too. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, how do you, I'm curious how you uh, speak with people who are say, especially given where you grew up and um, I'm sure have friends and family. Um, how do you deal with or communicate with people who still are, uh, you know, way pre doom? I mean, they haven't allowed themselves to go through the post doom doorway to this whole universe of gratitude. Uh, I, I've been speaking in some of these uh, conversations that I see doom as the midpoint between right. denial and regeneration or between denial and uh, death or extinction. And that the midpoint is doom, and we kind of avoid that with the whole classic stages of grief. But if we allow ourselves to go through the, the doom doorway, the post-doom doorway, we find a whole, a whole universe of possibility in terms of uh, not focusing any longer on the things that are beyond our control, not worrying about or being angry or frustrated about um, where we no longer can make a difference collectively or individually, but focusing rather, as you said, on where you can make a difference and what gives you life, what, where you can be a blessing to others or the larger community of life or whatever. Um, and I see as you approach the doom doorway, it says W-A-S-F. And then when you go through the doom doorway and turn back, it also said the post doom doorway and it says W-A-S-F, but it, it's interpreted very differently. Before you get there, you interpret it as we are so fucked. 
Right. After you go through, it's like, oh, wow, we are so fortunate that we get to be alive and conscious, even in these grieving times, these anguishing times, these uh, depressing times, but we can find good work to do, meaningful work to do um, in, in the face of all that. So how do you speak to techno optimists or people who are clearly not, you know, they're still in the bargaining phase or in right. full denial. How, how do you, and maybe not how do you speak to, but just how do you think about sort of techno-optimist, eco-modernist, people who still believe that technology or the market's going to save our butts. Right, right. Well, I, I think two answers to that. Number one is I always bring out the hockey stick because the hockey stick graph, I think, is, is pretty powerful. And especially when you see that it applies not just to climate change and increasing temperatures, but all sorts of environmental ins insults around the world. I mean, it, it applies to habitat destruction and freshwater depletion and overpopulation. And all of the impacts follow this hockey stick curve. And there's almost nothing that's going the other direction. And if you present a hockey stick graph enough times to people, they, um, the light will go on for them. I think that's really important. Yeah. But the other point that I make, especially to the, the, the people who frame this as a technological problem, I say, you're really missing the point because the, the fundamental thing here is our relationship with the world, our relationship with nature, our relationship with each other. That's the thing that matters. And that's the thing we're not talking about because yes. you can, you can paste on any number of technological solutions, but unless we address our relational uh, quality, we're not going to change anything. Um, I saw a presentation recently. It was um, about carbon capture. And the idea was, and the, the, the fellow who was presenting was, was quite optimistic about this. He said that, um, Bill Gates is pouring all this money now into these giant fans that are going to suck the carbon out of the air and how that gave him a, a great sense of hope. And I begged to differ. I said, yeah. no, that, that actually isn't hopeful at all because it avoids the conversation. It avoids the conversation that we need to be having about culture and our relationship to the world. And until we start having that conversation, um, we're not going to make any advances. We're not going to, it, it just is not going anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I appreciate you saying that. And one of the things I know uh, from when we spent uh, time together a few years ago is that we both hold William Catton's book, Overshoot, in, yeah. in high esteem. I know that uh, Overshoot was important for you too. Anything you want to say about that? Right. Well, I haven't picked that up for quite some time, but um, I think he was totally right. And this idea of carrying capacity and exceeding the carrying capacity and living on borrowed time, I think those are all perfectly valid concepts. Um, the, the one view I get of this that I think is really illuminating, I subscribed to an email called, um, I think it's Daily Overview. And this guy posts um, satellite images and drone images from around the world and every day there's a new one and typically they're urban shots and you can see the uh, organizational structure of cities around the world and you can see how thoroughly that humans have tyrannized the uh, the ecosystems of the world and you look at that and you go that's just not sustainable and it was it was unsustainable decades ago <laughs> So now we're in that overshoot phase. There's no, there's no getting around it. Some people find that their attention really focuses on the particular, mm -hmm. on the here and now, uh, especially the living world, the green world in terms of the here and now uh, or the animal world. Other people, uh, well, in addition to that, some people find the big picture, the universe story or epic of evolution or green history, big green history, uh, inspiring. And um, I know that uh, Joanna Macy, who's also a part of the series, uh, has spoken about, you know, in fact, this is a quote that I uh, uh, often include. She says, th this was, uh, she wrote it in with John Seed in Thinking Like a Mountain uh, Toward mm -hmm. a Council of All Beings. She said, there is a story now, there's, 
There is science now to construct the story of the journey that we have made on this earth, the story that connects us with all beings. Right now, we need to remember that story, to harvest it and taste it, for we are in a hard time. And it's the knowledge of the bigger story that's going to carry us through. So, Frank, have you found the universe story or epic of evolution inspiring in some way? Or what big picture do you hold that uh, you find uh, motivates you? Absolutely, yes. And um, I love the big history series by David Christian. Yeah. That, that's a fantastic piece. Um, and I'm really excited about this idea of LUCA. L-U-C-A stands for last universal common ancestor. And this is, this is not a, um, a fossil remains that has actually been discovered, but has been implied by looking back into deep history. And this notion that all organisms on the earth have come from LUCA, have come from this last universal common ancestor. So this Darwin's tree is, um, we're, we're beginning to see that that is how life on earth is constructed and it, it grows from that common root. So like it or not, we are all part of that common shared ancestry, which is a, a profoundly inspiring point of view. However, the one, um, the one thing that deviates from that is our cultural belief, especially in the West, of human supremacy. And this idea that we are somehow apart from nature or superior to nature denies basic biology. And that's, that's where we need to do some work, is bring that scientific story of evolution to public consciousness to show that we are all part of the same tree and that there is no human supremacy and that a little bit of modesty and humility is called for right now. Yeah, or a lot of modesty and humility. I, I see the I see uh, uh, hubris as really being what idolatry is about. It's not about bowing down to statues or believing in the wrong God. It's having a hubris, arrogant relationship to primary reality, the biosphere, right. the ecosphere where we think of the ecosphere or the biosphere as a lesser it rather than a greater thou. Um, and so humility is the only sustainable stance toward primary reality and hubris is the unsustainable stance. It's, it's the difference between thinking that we belong to the land, humility, or mm -hmm. the land belongs to us. Right. Hubris. Yeah. And I love the ancient Greek definition of hubris. I think I got this from John Michael Greer. I learned this originally from him. He says, hubris is the overweening pride of the doomed. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. But, uh, so so I, I see idolatry as relating to primary reality as not primary. Mm -hmm. uh, and so anthropocentrism or human centeredness really is the essence of unsustainability and ecocentrism or life-centeredness where we measure progress or well-being in life-centered terms by how well the soil and the forests and the other species, et cetera, are doing decade by decade. That's our only, um, that's our only, if humans survive this bottleneck, you know, the, the bottleneck is, is now guaranteed. The Homo colossus must go extinct. That is where each of us uses 20 to 50 times the resources and right. 20 to 50 times the waste. That doesn't necessarily mean human Homo sapiens will go extinct, although we might. Yeah. Uh, but if humans survive this bottleneck, they will only survive into the deep future, um, the next you know thousands or millions of years until a volcano or super volcano or an asteroid or something takes us out. If they come back to this humble relationship to primary reality, it seems mm -hmm. to me. So I, I'm glad you brought up human supremacy. I just interviewed Derek Jensen a few days ago. Yeah, yeah. The book by that title. Um, yeah. And uh, I think that's really key. Right. And, you know, if I, I often wonder about the deep future and if there are enough humans around, say, 10,000 years from now, and what a future historian would write about this age, what would that person say 
Beyond the obvious, I think that person would say that we worshipped the wrong things. Yeah, well, I think you're absolutely right. And I imagine, again, mythological consciousness always emerges in collapsed civilizations. We've seen that over and over and over again. And by mythological consciousness, it just means personifying various aspects of reality. So I imagine that just like the movie Avatar, where there's that scene that the colonel, when he's contemplating blowing up the Tree of Souls or whatever it is, right, right. Uh, he says, you know, we will create a, a crater in their racial memory that they will never forget. Yes. I think the collapse, the extinction of Homo Colossus, the collapse of global industrialism will be that crater. And let's just say that there's 200 pockets of humans that survive in you know, small places around the world. Mm -hmm. Each of them will mythologize the great crash, the big yeah. crash, yeah. Um, uh, the big impermanence in your words, um, in different ways, but they will all mythologize it, it seems to me. I can't imagine it, it could be otherwise. Right. Well, Frank, you know, many of us have had to restory the past as well as our sense of the future. And I'm curious if you have any if onlys, like if only humanity had done this by this time, or if only we hadn't taken this path or whatever, or has your interpretation or reinterpretation of the past moved more along the lines of inevitability? So I'm, I'm just curious about your response to that. Yeah, well, this is where I wonder about how broad a brush to use when we talk about homo sapiens. Because what a lot of people now are doing, and I, I often read in the New York Times any of the pieces about environmental uh, change, I read the comments section. And a lot of people use broad brush in the comments section. And they say that, um, that all human beings, the entire species is doomed because of certain characteristics that are common to all people, all humans. And that's the dark, broad brush. And I wonder about that. And I think that is not a particularly good path to go down because if you do that, then it's, it's, there's nowhere left to go if you consider all human beings fundamentally flawed. So what I choose to do is focus on culture and say, okay, there's certain cultures that do better and relate into the natural world than others. And so now, you, now you've got a place where you can get some traction. And now the brush is a little bit smaller. And so for me, I put my emphasis on the scientific revolution and how that fundamentally changed our relationship with the world. Um, something about the way we use our brain, this, uh, this fellow uh, McGilchrist, you might yes. be with his work, how he, he talks about the last 2,000 years the shift in the way that humans use the brain now is more on the left side and less on the right. And I think that that seems to be the case where we've changed our consciousness um, in such a way now we're much more analytical and less, um, less mythic. We're more interested in power and control than we are in integration with the world. And yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that up, Frank, because uh, it turns out that back in the late 80s, um, philosophy of language was my passion. Um, I mean, the most important course I ever took in my undergraduate and graduate work was philosophy of language. Mm -hmm. And Walter Ong, the great Jesuit scholar and schol uh, specifically focused on orality and literacy, and, and uh, Paul Kingsnorth actually just wrote something from the Dark Mountain Project. He wrote something... Um, I think it was published on Emergence or somewhere just recently, like a month ago, where he talked about uh, the fact that we don't have any examples of literate cultures, that is where literacy becomes commonplace, mm -hmm. that don't immediately go into, or perhaps already were there, um, a human centeredness, a human supremacy, a, 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 they really enter overshoot. They start using more resources and exuding more waste and because they're interpreting reality in human-centered, not life-centered terms. Right. And what Walter Ong and his books, uh, especially around orality and literacy, and then other scholars like Robert K. Logan, sort of Marshall McLuhan's successor up at the University of Toronto, who's also written extensively on how consciousness shifts from orality to literacy to print to mm -hmm. scientific consciousness, and then now all of the images. And um, 
it seems that a certain form of anthropocentrism is almost inevitable with literate cultures. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm grateful that you talked about the distinction between cultures. It's not humanity as a whole, homo sapiens, that is inherently flawed or inherently ecocidal, because all you got to do is pick up Robin Wall Kimmerer's amazing book, Braiding Sweetgrass, and she's going to be part of the series as well, or other profound indigenous writers yeah. who bring together scientific wisdom and indigenous uh, sensibility to recognize that there are indigenous forms of science. There's indigenous forms of paying attention and learning from the living world, again, right. as a thou, not a nit, um, and then systematizing that that doesn't require us to destroy it. So I think the the issue is one of anthropocentric cultures yeah yeah, yeah that's that's in anthropocentric cultures are inherently self-destructive but life-centered cultures that honor the living world and the voices of the living world as teachers and don't right. treat the living world merely as tools um i think that's a huge huge uh, distinction and a, and a, right uh, and those cultures tend to use the entire body to learn Oh, well, say more habitat. about that. Yes, yeah, say more about that. The entire body instead of just this upper left quadrant of the head. And that makes a big difference. Yeah, well, say more about that because that's really uh, something you specialize in. So, so go into that a little bit. In general, the left side of the brain, now there's some dispute about this because the, the two hemispheres of the brain are connected via the corpus callosum. But the, um, and, and so they're, constantly talking to one another but some of those fibers are inhibitory and it's easy to imagine that one hemisphere could inhibit the other and what we think is happening is that the left side which is primarily devoted to language logic linear thinking all these l words on the left tending to inhibit the activity of the right, which is more mythological and more body-centered, um, that is rewarded in modern culture. And so the more of it we do, the more we do. And that's what we're up against now. So that's also the reason why the body is more and more pushed to the back burner in modern culture. We don't honor or respect the body anymore because we're, we're a digitized world now, and we don't even use the body to learn the world. Yeah. So that's, that's part of the problem. But I, I hear what you're saying about indigenous ideas, indigenous wisdom. The author uh, Sherman Alexie had a great little quip. He looked at white culture, modern white culture, and his response was, you're going to need us. Oh, yeah. Amen. And I said, yes. Wow, that really hit the nail on the head because he could see where we're going. He could see the, the crash. And he said, you're going to need our point of view. And I think he's absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, just prior to, uh, I, think, I don't think I had the recording going when I was telling you about a book that I began listening to. Um, and I think I really originally got from you. Um, and that is The Old Way by Elizabeth Marshall Thomas. Um, say a little bit about that because you, you said something just before I started recording that I wanted to make sure this part of this conversation. Right. Well, for me, that's the quintessential paleo book. And you know, paleo um, is kind of hot right now. There's a lot of people on paleo diets and talking about paleo foods and that sort of thing. But she actually grew up with the Kalahari Bushmen and before they really uh, met the modern world. And so she knows what it's like to live in a tribal community. And it's a completely different world there where, the, from my point of view, the primary difference from paleo and modern is the, the lack of focus on the individual. In, in paleo communities. Yes. We're going to survive in a um, harsh outdoor environment. You need other people in your tribe. And it doesn't make sense to think of yourself so much as an individual. And what's happened over the last several hundred years is what I call the hardening of the self. And if you think of the paleo experience, you probably wouldn't have had that much self-consciousness. You might have seen a reflection of your face in a pool of water, and that's about it. 
But starting in the 19th century, we start to have the technology of mirrors and cameras. And now all of a sudden people see their reflection more and more. And individualism becomes more a feature of the modern world. And we have these whole industries now devoted to the self. And people spend a lot more time thinking about me. David Brooks, uh, writing in the New York Times, calls this era of narcissism the big me. And so now we have this, this culture, the society, devoted to we worship the individual. Whereas in, in paleo communities, that would have been considered extremely rude to, do, to focus on the individual. So well, more that's than, a big difference. Yeah, I think more than extremely rude, it would have also been seen as um, dysfunctional. Yeah. I mean, just from a science-based perspective, we now know that, uh, you know, my, I'll speak personally, Michael Dowd doesn't exist without my microbiome. Yeah, yeah. So, so myself, if my sense of self does not include, kind of like Russian nesting dolls, if my yeah, yeah. sense of self doesn't include the smaller nested, creative, intelligent realities that I depend upon, and the larger nested creative realities upon which I depend, like the trees and the algae and other plants and animals and blah, 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 then my sense of, and my community, if my sense of self is just Alan Watts's skin encapsulated ego, right, right. that's dysfunctional. And so what you're pointing out is that mirrors and cameras and other technologies in the 19th century heightened the obsession with the small self yeah. and the narrow self. Right. And the cost, uh, the cost to, uh, to society and to the living world especially has been catastrophic. Right, right. And we see this all over the place because there's entire industries now devoted to individuals, right. and it's particularly obvious in the world of medicine and uh, mental health. We've had these shootings recently. Well, we always focus on the, the mental state of that particular shooter as an individual. And we don't talk about their continuity with the community at large. Yes. So. Yeah, exactly. Well, this is great. Uh, so, Frank, I want to bring back around to what we just began touching on, what you began touching on earlier, which is impermanence and death. So, some of us have found that holding impermanence and death as essential, natural, necessary, no less sacred than life, um, supports post-doom consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, are there ways of thinking about your own mortality um, that assist you with being at peace with uh, our species mortality, whether that's the near term uh, or if we've still got a couple million years uh, in us, uh, how does thinking about immortality, I mean, not immortality, how does thinking about impermanence and mortality, your own, assist you in larger understandings of impermanence and mortality? Well, it's, it's all, it, some Buddhist teachers talk about human life as being like, you're born and then you get on a boat, but you know the boat is going to sink. And you're going off into the ocean and you know full well that the boat is going to sink. And that is the human experience. And the same thing is true in a larger sense. And the beauty of that is that um, it tends to focus you. And the older you get, the more focused you can become if you, if you practice it that way. Um, or you can just stay with distraction and denial and amusement. But um, the beauty of keeping your eye on the impermanence is that it can help you focus on the things that you find meaningful. So I, I see them as being really two sides of the same experience. And unfortunately, our, our modern culture is, is failing to, to do this. But... Um, you know, we can do this as individuals too. So yeah, yeah, amen. Well, you know, again, it's one of these. It just occurred to me as you were speaking, uh, talking about a sort of a pretty cool, serendipitous reality that I think you and I met uh, originally uh, in the uh, uh, in the parking lot of the. Uh, the ferry going to Wigby Island. Yeah. And I think I may have been coming back from a chemotherapy infusion because I, I went through chemotherapy at the Seattle cancer care Alliance and we stayed on Wigby Island for four months while I was going through that process when I was diagnosed with a very aggressive form of cancer. 
And there was a period of about a month where we thought that I could die in the next eight months. And mm -hmm. once chemo started working, uh, we realized that that wasn't likely. But I, I've not lost that treating each season as if it could be my last. Yeah, really yeah. having that spiritual practice of death and my mortality as my advisor, as my spiritual friend. And Connie and I actually have a little ritual that at the end of each season, um, right around the equinoxes and solstices, we have this little ritual, usually at sunset, where we'll speak aloud, we'll personify the season and we'll say like, you know, thank you, spring, mm -hmm. for being such an awesome season. If one or both of us do not experience you next year. Like if one or both of us dies before you come around again next year, we just cherish what a blessing you have been this season. And we actually hold that in inner silence. And sometimes I'll move to tears and that sort of thing. Yeah, and yeah. that consciousness for me began right around the time when I met you <laughs> when I was going through cancer treatment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember you were – you had no hair back then. <laughs> yeah, right. No, exactly. That's exactly what it was. It was uh, 10 years ago uh, in, uh, uh, at the uh, Muckleteo Ferry. Uh, right, going right. Yeah, well, you know, another phrase that comes to mind sometimes when I, when I speak on these issues, um, I talk about our normal response, which is to distract and deny and amuse and, and retreat from the challenge. And I say, no, we got to turn this around and say that the crisis is the way, the crisis is the path, go directly at it, because that is what it will teach you how to live. And it's, you know, Pima Chodron writes about this too. She wrote, writes, the wisdom of no escape. And I, I think she's totally right about that. It's like the, the more you can face it and get right up with it, the better the teaching. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for that. Well, that moves real right into my last two sort of sets of questions, uh, one related to gifts. So in coming to terms with all this stuff, um, have you encountered stages of grieving that went beyond mere acceptance? Uh, what Paul Chaferka talks about is finding the gift. Like, how has that been for you? What, what, what's opened up for you positively on the other side of the, the, the post-doom doorways? Right, well, I see... I see some pretty courageous people out there who, who see the crisis and they understand the urgency and the magnitude of it. And they're standing up and they're willing to take big risks, personal risks to, to speak truth to, to this situation. And for example, I take great inspiration from Greta Thunberg. I think she's fantastic. And she's turning on a lot of people around the world. And she's saying, look, we have to be talking about this stuff. So that's, uh, that's a place where I can get, draw some inspiration. And just studying biology. I mean, every time I go back to looking at biology and the history of life, it's like, wow, this is so precious. This one little blue, you know, Carl Sagan's view, this one little blue dot that produces this immensity of, of life. Yeah, well, I mean, you touched on something where I find my own inspiration, which is that sense of identity, like who I am, myself. Myself really is one with time or, or continuous with time. Continuous. The, yeah. the past, the multi-billion year past lives in you and in me. I know this is not news to you, but a lot of us don't think along these lines very often is that the past lives in us and in the world right now. The entire 14 billion year history of the universe is right here right now. And long after we're gone, it all continues. And we're part of that. We're not separate from that. So I see that continuity with time uh, as all indigenous cultures had that sense of, of, of uh, being faithful to the past and being a contribution or a blessing uh, or in service to the future. Right, right. And, and, and consulting, what is the past telling us about how to live in the present so we are a blessing rather than a curse to the future? But also a continuity with space that, that, that uh, literally the atoms that make us up were created inside stars like supernovas and red giants and, and that, you know, the, that the oxygen that we breathe that nourishes us, we couldn't have this conversation if it weren't for the food we've eaten in the last few weeks right. and the breaths that we've taken in the last few hours uh, or a few minutes. Um, and so that, that sense of self 
with time and space is one of the things that I find uh, allows me to stay present to the gift of these contracting, chaotic, challenging um, times right. as, as well. Right. The people at Extinction Rebellion have a great phrase. They say, we are nature rising up. Yes, amen. I love that. I mean, that is, it's the earth rising up to protect herself. Yes, I remember John Seed years ago spoke, the, the great uh, deep ecologist spoke that I am not, this is John Seed speaking, I am not John Seed protecting the rainforest. I'm the rainforest protecting itself through John <laughs> yeah, Seed. Yeah, yeah, I love that. So, all right, last question related to remaining opportunities. So uh, we just added this. Actually, I've had about a dozen calls so far, and uh, we only came up with this one yesterday. So you're the first person that I get to ask, ask this question of, which is, that, what is your take on what is beyond our control and where we can still make a difference, individually and or collectively? In other words, what's your sense of what is no longer possible and what is still possible? Things that are beyond our control, I think things like habitat destruction, freshwater depletion, uh, some of these things are so far down the road that they're, they're really, there's no conceivable path to changing those, absent some huge contraction in the human population. Um, so that horse has already left the barn. But... Um, our experience of this time in history can change because I think we have a choice. We can allow the stress of this to just crush us and we can go out polarized. We can go out um, with violence. We can go out in just this spasm, this frenzy of, of angst, or we can find some peace and dignity here. And that, that is something we could do. That is, is completely within our, within our control to change our culture and to have the conversations where we can find some way to, uh, to harmonize with it. And yeah, especially that, that's gonna require our artists, our writers, our people who are risk takers, who are willing to step up and, and have these authentic conversations. Yeah, yeah, amen. Wow, this is great. Anything, Frank, that you would like to say sort of uh, to, uh, to be complete with this conversation and then share a little bit about how people can learn more about your work? Oh, right. Well, just go outside. <laughs> That's, that is uh, the, the best advice that I can give to most people is like, we have to spend more time, more time outdoors. That's absolutely essential. And get in contact with the thing, with your life support system, which is outdoors and the people in your life, spend your, your time where it matters. And as far as what I'm doing, um, you can find me at exuberantanimal.com. That's easy. And I'm also starting this new project called the Sapiens Project. And the idea is that I will have interviews with people who have something to say about wisdom. And one thing I want you to mention, just because it was so cool when I met you, when Connie and I met you, is that you've got this little car that's like a, a, a roving <laughs> office, bedroom. You've got your dog there. So say something about your uh, your at least during the summer, your more portable uh, means of being in the outdoors a lot and also getting work done. Right. Well, this actually dovetails with our conversation because uh, one path forward for people is what's called minimalism, trying to do as much as you can with the least amount of stuff. And so I've got this older Honda Element that I've customized, and it's sort of a miniature RV. And I, I spent a lot of years as a climber, so I know how to live in small spaces and do, you know, with, with small number of things. And so I can have my, my sleeping bag and my dog and my camera and boom, off I go. And it's very exciting <laughs> that way. So, yeah, when you say a mini in RV, we're talking mini, mini RV. <laughs> yeah. but it's, just, it's awesome in terms of maximizing space and giving you a place to work, to sleep, to, to travel, and yet also to spend uh, a super quality time outdoors, so. Right, yeah, and my, my philosophy on that is, you, if you're human in the modern world, you're gonna have an impact somehow, but you can reduce it and keep it low, and life is better that way. For more information about this project, 
go to postdoom.com.